Welcome to the podcast. Super excited to welcome a return guest, Dr. Jill Johnson. She is the president at Class Intercom. And I asked her back because I have a team of student interns that I am working with at New Auburn, and I needed some help. And so this is almost a little therapy session for me because I'm actually trying to get help with how I'm training in assigning stories. So um, Jill is going to bring a lot of value in regards to how to train storytellers and specifically student storytellers. Um, she's going to go through, you know, how to really uncover those stories that deserve to be told um, and talk about competitions and how that can help in generating some content. And, you know, just even video tips, um, trying to get the right things on camera. Um, she has is going to talk several times about a content generation workshop. We're going to get you a link if you're interested in that. It's happening in the fall of 2024. I'm planning to be there with my team of students. I don't know how many students will be with me, but I'm going to be there. So if you want to be there too, click on the link in the show notes and get signed up uh, so that you can at least get notified when that registration is open or it might be open already. We'll see. Um, but check that out. Um, very excited. And you guys, I love learning from people like Jill and I love learning from people like you. And it's that time of year where Social School for EDU gives out the most coveted prize in all of social media land for schools. And it's the Golden Gribbles. Yes, it's our best of social media awards. We actually give out a golden gribble little statue, little um, trophy. Okay. And of course it's a gold thumbs up, you know, but uh, we've got a lot of categories and I'd love for you to jump over. It's a self-nomination. So you don't have too much pride in order to say, hey, I think we deserve to be recognized. Um, we had, I think over... 300 people, 300 entries last year. I'm expecting well over 600 entries this year. Um, so get entered. You can enter up to three different categories. Very easy to do. Give us as many specifics as you can. Um, awards like Instagram Idol Award or Top Twitter, or maybe you're leveraging LinkedIn. Maybe it's short video or long video. Um, it's a kindness uh, story. It's a staff feature. So get registered, get signed up, um, apply for that, uh, those Golden Gribble Awards, and we'll be handing those out on School Communicators Day, which this year is May 10th. So we're going to do it in a live little uh, webinar, and you can uh, jump onto that and learn and then see if you win. So that's my advice for today. Now let's get to today's K-12 PR tip. All right. Today's K-12 PR tip, we've talked a lot on this podcast about AI and um, the beneficial uses of AI in helping to create some engaging social media content, among other things, in your role as a school communicator. But what I want to caution you is, can you tell, if you're reading something, can you tell that it was written by AI? And does that bother you just a little bit? I mean, it's like, really? Like, this doesn't seem as authentic. And uh, today, one of uh, Jill's, Dr. Jill Johnson's biggest tip is being authentic. So I just want to caution you. AI is a great tool, and it can give you a, fir a great first draft, but it is never the final draft. Um, it is always going to throw in way too many emojis and hashtags and over-the-top words that you normally wouldn't use, and you need to edit those. So please... Make sure that when you're looking at your social media pages, your content and, and other things that you must write for your school, that it's not easily detectable that says, oh, AI wrote this. Mm, that was real hard. Like I feel lied to or something like that. Okay. Make sure that you're taking some time to edit, adding your own flair, adding your own brand voice, uh, because I do see somebody, some people. Uh, not anybody individually, I'm not calling you out, but some that are overusing it a little bit. And so I want to caution you against that. So that's my tip right now is just, you know, look back at your posts. If you are using AI, can you easily tell that it's all AI? Then you got to change it up a little bit. Okay. All right. Now let's get into today's deep dive into students as contributors on your social media pages with Dr. Jill Johnson from Class Intercom. 
Welcome back to the podcast, Dr. Jill Johnson in the house. How are you? Good. Great to see you again. Great to see you. We're really sad we won't be seeing each other in person at TSPRO this year, but you've got all the magic reels going on. Um, pretty good stuff you and Ben are putting out. We're, we're having some fun. Um, a lot of stuff about hashtag hot comms because uh, we know communicators have to deal with a lot of issues. Um, but yeah, we're going to miss seeing you, but we're also uh, working on some karaoke and I'm going to dedicate my song to you. Yeah. You're the inspiration. Yeah. Oh, I love it. Yes. Um, <laughs> Jill and I are both singers and, uh, you know, been friends, uh, and, and kind of colleagues for years now. So we've got you in another, uh, podcast interview. Um, but why don't you just kind of share your background and your role as president of class intercom? Yeah, you bet. So I was an educator for 30 years, and I still definitely consider myself an educator, uh, was a teacher, um, did professional development, and then uh, was a high school administrator for um, several years. Um, and during that time, while I was dealing with a lot of kind of negative things with student social media issues, I was also charged with doing the, the communications. And um, so I got to see both sides of the power of social media and uh, that we really need to help uh, support our storytelling, but also support kids in doing that storytelling. And so did my dissertation work on student-led social and the leadership that allows it. So it's kind of how I ended up at Class Intercom. I was a client. It was a godsend to me um, in managing all of that and making sure we were doing it very securely. And so um, that's how I ended up here. Awesome. So when we, when you took this role, you said you had a goal of the number of schools that are using students as storytellers. You wanted to get to a certain number. What mm -hmm. was that goal? What was that all about? And how are you coming along? Yeah. So it's kind of my big, big, hairy goal. Um, so two and a half years ago, when I started here, um, that goal was that we would have a social media team, student social media team, in every high school in the country. Um, and I get, that's a big goal. That was my 10 year goal. Um, and so I want it to be like a team, just like the basketball team or the speech team. Um, and that's what we were doing when I was an, an administrator. And it was just so cool to see kids be competitive and vie for those spots and want to improve throughout the season. Um, and so we're, we're doing well. Um, it's been really cool to see the growth of that. Some schools have maybe just an intern or two or five. Um, others have full teams. Um, and we're really seeing that grow um, with our workshop and some of the other competitions that we're hosting um, and really trying to build that and give students that authentic place to tell stories, but in a very secure way. So doing okay, but I don't have every high school in the country quite yet. <laughs> yeah, but we're making progress and it's certainly something I'm I'm passionate about as well because there's such great storytellers. Now you mm -hmm. have a competition coming up. Is that just for clients or is that for anybody? It isn't that happening in March? Yeah. So the one we have coming up, this will be in March and it's at NEDA, which is the Nebraska Educators Technology Association. And we're based in Nebraska. So um, they had reached out to us and asked if we'd like to partner with them. So this first year, we are actually just having three teams. Uh, so three high school teams are coming in person and they will be competing during a three hour period um, in kind of a sweepstakes of events that they get to pick and choose with their teams uh, right from that conference. Um, everything from making hype videos to uh, posting uh, Instagram stories and they get different uh, points uh, for those. Um, we'll also have experts on site that will be supporting them. So if they're writing a blog, uh, they'll have an expert marketer there um, helping them with that, giving them feedback, um, inspiration um, right during that competition. Okay. So the, the competitions between three teams, actually they did something like this at um, the Wisconsin education convention in January Oh yeah, because these kids were walking around and they're like, yeah, we're doing we're in a competition and I thought it was all separate like teams, but it was, I think a couple schools. And I was like, Hey, if you want anybody on video, I am your gal. Like in, so <laughs> a little later they came over and I, I don't know if much of my interview was, but probably a lot of my gestures were because I, uh, I'm a big uh, hand gesture when I'm talking. Mm -hmm. Um, so I love that, that, you know, uh, organizations like that are using students 
in being able to promote those types of events, right? Yeah. And that's cool. That's cool to hear that. I might have to dig in a little and see who's, see who's hosting that. But yeah, so what we found out, we do our workshop every fall and have a um, couple hundred kids on site. We also had three satellite locations this year, as well as 30 other states um, streaming in and they really love the competitions and they love the challenges. And so this kind of naturally led into that where our workshop can be a day of learning with small challenges. And then this competition, you know, really be like, it's, it's game time, right? Like, just like when you have a, a tip off in a basketball game, or you actually have to give that speech that you've been working on practicing in your mirror that you now have to have for an audience and ready to go, like really being live live and in the moment and having some uh, real life deadlines and those kind of things. So I think it's exciting to see, and I'm glad to hear uh, that's happening other places too. Yeah, definitely. So um, I have now developed an internship program in little new Auburn. Mm -hmm. We, we only have about a hundred kids in our high school and I've got six kids involved and we're not as far as I'd like to, you know, we've met four times, I think four Mondays, cause we're only meeting once a week. Um, but I, I really was kind of selfish in this interview, Jill, because I need some help. So you're going to help uh, provide a little bit of therapy for me today. And I'm sure our listeners are going to love to listen along. But what are some of the key training aspects to help students become content creators mm -hmm. instead of just consumers? Because I think we all automatically kind of think like, oh, these kids know what they're doing. They don't necessarily know what they're doing. And so what are some of those key training aspects for the students? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think you're, you're with a lot of other people that we think, well, if kids want to be content creators and they're, they're social media experts, cause they're on there consuming all the time. And, and that's just not the, the reality. They also don't know what it's like to create content for someone other than themselves. So even if they're active on social, for them creating it for their school, um, that's very different. And they tend to want to just follow our lead rather than taking risks. That was something I really had to push my students on originally. Like, I want you to push the boundaries. I want you to be creative. I want you to take risks. That was hard for them, hard for them to do. But so I think a couple of things. Um, one, I think you really need to make sure and give them a specific um, assignment. So if you just say create content, they don't know where to start. You know, it's really, it's easy to start with. Uh, I know you talk a lot about those celebratory things, whether it's um, National Principals Month or National Paraprofessionals Day or giving a shout out to your custodians. Um, those types of things are really um, kind of easy, safe places to start and let them be creative and humanize that. And then, you know, you can start to go beyond maybe some other trends and start to look at those. Um, I think the other thing is you don't want to try to overtrain them. Uh, working with school PR professionals, that is exactly what you are. You are professionals. You're amazing photographers, videographers, storytellers. And these kids are not going to be that. But often what stops the scroll is some of that variety. It's not the perfect polished picture. It's not the, the video um, in the way that you would have it done. It's a little rougher cut, maybe not the best lighting, not the best angle. And even though we want to teach them and try to get them to a higher level of production, it's that really authentic uh, uh, storytelling from different points of view view that's going to um, add variety and I always say you know it becomes part of that tapestry of your school's stories um, that really lends itself to to variety and people uh, really wanting to stop and dig in a little bit more so don't try to overtrain them from the start I think obviously we want to have um, correct spelling correct grammar um, we do want some type of visual we want our hashtags to be there so what are the basics and the bottom line giving them a nice framework for what that's supposed to look like um, can be really helpful too. Um, but then it's really, you know, a bit of learning as they go. But I think having specific things you want them to post is key because if you leave it up to them, it won't, it just won't happen. Yeah. And what I noticed too, like I, you know, they're living in this bubble of being at school every day. It's been their life for maybe 10 years already. And they don't really realize all of the things that they take for granted that the community really does not get to see. Mm -hmm. So I feel like, you know, when I interviewed the kids, I'm like, well, you know, I do the social media, so I get content from staff members, 
but I know we're not sharing everything. And I'm like, what stories do you think deserve to be told that aren't being told? And they're like, well, I think, I think everything's being told. It's like, yeah. No, it isn't. It's like, there's so many, <laughs> there's mm-hmm. so many good things behind the scenes, different programs, um, different support systems and, um, you know, just stories that deserve to be told. But I think they really feel like, well, this is what we live every day. So everybody knows that this is what we do. Is there, yeah. are, are there any keys to getting them to look at things in a little bit different lens? Well, I think because their reality is, um, so much smaller than ours, you know, their history. So when we think about over time, when I was in high school, which was a long time ago now, um, or or any any grade of school, K-12, um, parents could just come in, you know, they'd drop off lunches and, and visit in the classrooms and all these things. And because of school safety, uh, COVID obviously put a wrench in things, we've had to push people out. And so it's good to remind them that Um, you know, parents don't get to see the everyday. So even if it's that elementary principal going down the slide and high five and the kids on the playground, that's an everyday for that, that instance, that probably that, that principal probably might do it every day, but our parents don't get to see that. And so it's important that we know um, uh, that, that they are interested in that. I know you eat lunch in the cafeteria every day, but your parents are never there. Your your community stakeholders, your taxpayers, they are not there. So show them what that looks like. Um, show them what it looks like when you're practicing after school uh, for the, the musical that's coming up. And so those stories that may seem mundane to them because they're living it every day um, are really special to those who, who don't have that insight or grandparents who live far away. So um, I think kind of just giving them a little bit of that perspective um, is important. Yeah. And I like the specific assignment because I think that's really similar to uh, anybody listening who gets content from staff. Sometimes you're just like, just send me a story. Send me something happening in your classroom. But then when you can like send something to a tech ed teacher and say, hey, I'd really like a picture of a student with their project. And they'll be like, oh, okay, uh, you know, or an art art student with their with their uh, you know masterpiece. And mm-hmm. yes, I can send you that. Um, I think that that's really you usually get a better um, a better story, a better picture or video, um, just something that you can share. And so we've got to be specific. Also, deadlines are really important too. And because I've talked to other people that have included kids, sometimes they're perfectionists. So what should take them a week is taking them four weeks. Um, Mm -hmm. But the other thing is, is like, okay, now you need to get this done by like Thursday this week. I know this isn't a class. I know this isn't for a grade and you're not getting paid, but we, if, if there's something we need to celebrate this week, we got to celebrate it this week. We can't just miss it. Mm -hmm. Most teachers know if you give them five minutes, they'll take five minutes. If you give them five days, they'll take five days. And if you give them five weeks, they'll take five weeks. So Deadlines are huge and knowing that it's uh, for growth and feedback, right? I know in our platform, we have feedback built right in along with a lot of other just strong um, pedagogy uh, that really supports educators because it is it is a place to grow and learn. I remember a couple of the first lessons I had to teach my kids, you know, yeah, we're not using bomb emojis. You know, we're just not, <laughs> we're just not going to do that. And so, um, and, and then explaining to them why, you know, so right. um those, those kind of lessons are really important um, as we work through that. When you were talking a little bit about um, the CTE people too, I know I had, thinking about purpose is so important. What are we trying to do? Are we trying to increase engagement? When we talk about telling our story, why? Why are we doing that? And I know I had a... Um, a CTE teacher, he he taught woodworking and he really wanted to get more females in his classes because it was just predominantly male and that's what the culture was there. So uh, that's what the students were doing. They were charged with capturing more photos of females actually in the shop um, and doing it and making it, you know, really just normalizing that. And it, it really changed his enrollment. And uh, uh, that was just from one semester of being very um, strategic and intentional about posting photos of females in the shop rather than just males, because that's who was uh, typically in the picture. And so you can really facilitate change when you have that purpose and are intentional about what you are posting and knowing the why behind it. Yeah. I, the other thing that I, I guess I just noticed, cause again, sometimes it's like, it's pretty easy to do, but sometimes it's like if they, if you don't walk them through it. So, um, 
at the time of this recording, it's still early February and February 22nd is known as school bus driver appreciation day. So I'm like, let's make a little video. And then I'm like, I only had two of the six students, which was actually way easier. My best advice is start small and then grow. Don't think <laughs> yeah. you're going to get a whole bunch of people, but because you got to get a couple trained in real well, and then they can help train the others. But um, so Mason and I were working on it and I'm like, let's just start right now. And so he practiced first with me and I was showing him how to do some of the editing. And then uh, I'm like, well, who do you want to interview? He's like, how about Kyra? Which Kyra is my daughter and she's one of our uh, interns who does really good job with using emojis and and uh, all of this thing, all of the things, um, just because she's watched her mom do it for 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, but Kyra did a great job of doing a little video and she rides the bus when it comes to athletic events. And then I'm like, well, we got 20 minutes go find, you know, five more kids and, and videotape them. And so he did that. And by the end of the 20 minutes, like it was, that little video was already done. Mm -hmm. It was awesome. But yeah, I think it's we, mm -hmm. go ahead. No, I was just going to say the same thing at our um, workshop in the fall, we call them quick hit challenges. And we give, we give kids five minutes, they get a challenge and then they have five minutes to come up with an idea, do it, and then get it posted. And they're always like, oh, I wish we had more time. I could do better if I had more time. Yes, that's true. But sometimes we we do it as adults too. We overthink and ideate about things to death, right? And so sometimes you just gotta, just gotta do it and then see maybe how could I do it better next time? Or I've got I've got this footage of these interviews with these students, um, but what we're missing really is we need to talk to one of the bus drivers. We need to get on the bus and have some, uh, put a GoPro camera on the bus driver's head or something, you know, and just see what else can we get. And then you can start to build on that if you have time or ideas for the next, uh, the next time, the next year. Yeah, because what I noticed is I think, you know, he went out and said, hey, we're going to thank the bus drivers for all they do. And everybody basically said the same thing. And I know that some of these now, Jill, we're such a small school. You know how many bus routes we have before and after school? Three. Okay. We got three bus drivers. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, we got one fill in that, that helps as well. So three bus drivers, but I was hoping for, oh my gosh, I love Robin. She's my bus driver. She always makes sure that, you know, my day starts with a smile or, you know, some, some, something like that. And, and I didn't mm -hmm. get that yet. And so I kind of want to challenge, like, how do you ask questions to get those types of more feel good, emotional responses? Mm -hmm. What are some tips, you know, in working with students on that aspect? Yeah, for sure. I think that you're, I think you're saying it right there as you're talking through that and you're thinking about what is it that you want. I'm a big believer, you know, begin with the end in mind um, and think about what is it that I want. And if it's, I want something emotional and that people are going to really connect to because everyone has ridden on a bus at some point in their life. And so um, then you start to back that up and think about what am I hoping for? What do I really want them to say? It used to drive me crazy. The journalism kids would come and say, hey, can I get a quote for, for the yearbook? A quote? A quote about what? Ask me a question. You know, how can I evoke that emotional response? Um, they know it's when it's something I'm passionate about. Uh, how can I how can I talk to them about? So, you know, what's your favorite memory of a bus driver? Uh, what's the most fun you had on on a on a bus? Uh, what's the craziest thing that ever happened to you on a school bus? I feel like <laughs> you could ask some teachers and probably maybe not get what you want to publish, but you might get some fun responses too. Um, and so I think it's uh, really helping them work through that with some sample questions, uh, but thinking about beginning with the end in mind. Yeah, that's really good. And I think it's also important just that they realize that you can edit it afterwards. So he was doing it all in vertical because we're going to put it in as a reel, but um, just knowing that you can ask more questions and your voice can be on the camera, but then you'd be quiet and you let them have the answer. You mm -hmm. don't have to necessarily be part of the finished video. Um, but I, I think uh, uh, I was just going to say another good tip. I, I hear this a lot with kids, like kids, people say, well, the kids don't want to be on the video if they're interviewing. I don't think it makes the best video when it shows both of you. So right. you can even tell your subject, um, depending on who it is or what the context is, but have them repeat the question, you know, or, or phrase their answer with that question. You know, my yeah. favorite memory on a uh, school bus is, um, and then have them finish it. So it does come across a little cleaner um, and then you can edit it in whatever way you want. Yeah. 
So when it comes to letting kids be on social media and actually do the posting, which we haven't really started um, completely yet uh, at our school, they're submitting things to me. But many schools are really nervous about handing over that full control to students. So how does Class Intercom help with that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. We um, we allow for an unlimited number of users to be on the platform, but schools connect their social media platforms to us. So then you're just letting kids, uh, you're getting them on class intercom. You're not giving them passwords to Instagram or Facebook or anything like that. They're publishing it. They're pushing it through class intercom. And then there's a moderation system. So for instance, your interns could create content, they could collaborate on it with other students or you, uh, but then once they submit it to be posted, um, then you can approve it, you can edit it, you can give them feedback, um, you can schedule it for future, uh, you know, to post next week, whenever you want to do. Um, and so it's going to go through that moderation system. So we have elementary and junior high kids, uh, even under the age of 13, um, who are able to post. We always have them get, we like them to get parent permission uh, just so that parents know what they're doing, but they're not actually connecting with the, the social platform. They're just in class intercom and then the adults or whoever's been given permission is going to approve those to then go out. So it's a really um, authentic yet secure way to allow kids to practice um, not only content creation, but digital citizenship because they're able to see, you know, comments and everything that come back to. Mm -hmm. So question, um, do they mainly use their own device or they do some schools provide a device? How does that work? Mm -hmm. Most are using their own devices um, for photos, just because most of them have uh, phones and most, many of them have high quality phones too, or that they can take decent photos with. So they're able to post right from there, um, from our app. Um, but then a lot of them are also creating content and graphics on their school issued devices, especially in one-to-one -one districts where they maybe have a Chromebook or um uh, Mac Airbook or something like that so that they're able to, um, you know, download photos and then create content from there as well. Um, a lot of our schools use Canva or um, Adobe to uh, also create graphics and those types of things. Um, and so students will a lot of times use their school issued devices for that. Okay. So there's a desktop version of Class Intercom and an app version. Yep. And I can imagine that because they're like uploading it, you get more of a finished product because they know that, Hey, somebody's going to review this versus like right now they're emailing to me. And the one day, I mean, the gal was in a hurry, but she emailed me, you know, two videos that she took, but they totally weren't like put together or anything. And so I still had to do some editing. So you're going to probably get a much more finished, complete, uh, piece of content from them because it does have to be kind of ready to go. Yeah. And it, it looks like that. They're able to preview it. Let's say I'm going to send it to Facebook, Instagram, X, and LinkedIn. They're going to be able to see a finished product of that on each platform okay. and see how does it look on Instagram versus how does it look on X. Um, and you can make adjustments then for the platforms. But right. Um, one of my, you know, teachers used to text me photos. I, when I present, I share, uh, I had these awesome photos from a biology lab, but I could not speak eloquently at all about what they were doing. So it's multiple text or emails back and forth and then trying to, to, to actually say something appropriate for social um, can be really difficult. And so this way, yeah, they're constructing it. They're adding the hashtags, they're tagging, but then you could also give feedback and say, you know, Hey, um, you really need to um, add where this was taking place, what it is. Maybe you forgot a hashtag. You can edit it if you want and do those things and give the feedback. That's the nice thing too. Let's say it's a score update. It needs to go out right now, but they have a typo. You could correct that, go ahead and push it out, but even give them feedback. Hey, make sure you make sure you proofread so that you uh, don't misspell competition or whatever the word might be. Right. Um. So how far in advance can you schedule on class intercom? As far as you want. We have a lot of schools that'll do the, do a whole year in advance, especially of those days we were mentioning, like the National Custodians Day and those things. Okay. Because mm -hmm. that's important because now Facebook, Meta, I mean, we do all our scheduling through there. It used to be six months and it was 75 days. Now it's only 29 days. And so it's so hard because 
you just some things you want to schedule out further. So that's a really another big bonus. Whether or not you use students in your storytelling or not, class intercom can still be a great tool. I know that you also have archiving uh, benefits and all of that, that as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. We really, yeah. I like to promote student use, but it is a lot of just having more storytellers, you know, even teachers right. from the classroom and others, even uh, sometimes it's parents too. Yeah. Okay. So one of the questions I have is Instagram reels um, and Facebook reels, but I, I mainly make my reels in Instagram. So how does your platform work with this feature and can you schedule reels and can you create reels with all the bells and whistles that I would in the regular Instagram app if I'm working through class intercom? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So great question. Um, we're always a little bit at the mercy of their APIs. Mm -hmm. And so it's awesome that Instagram has really worked with us where it used to be, we could only do one post one photo and then it was 10 photos and now it's reels and stories. So we can't, can't do every bell and whistle. Um, right now we're a little limited on, let's say if you want to have a poll, um, you can't do that through our platform. They just limit us on that. But what a lot of our students will do, um, and also staff, if they want to poll, they'll put everything they want in there. They'll say, can you please make this a poll? Because we have that that messaging um, uh, notes right within our app. And then whoever is posting it to Instagram can just go ahead and do that with the Instagram bells and whistles right from our from our platform. But then you're linking in because you're the one person with the with the login credentials. Does that okay. make sense? Yeah. So yeah. And and some of us have had to do that. I'm I'm sure some of you listening, you don't have the ability to to post Instagram stories and Facebook stories or Instagram reels and Facebook reels at the same time. So some of you might hit the little download button. So it's almost like you're downloading it and then you can add a few more bells and whistles right on Instagram, right? If you want to add more bells and whistles, if you but want otherwise, to. yeah, otherwise you can go directly to um, stories and reels and Facebook reels right from class intercom now. Okay. And, and do you have um, all the audio options too, that would be available for reels in your platform? I hate to say all. Okay. Um, or most like creator mode. I mean, cause creator mode has mm -hmm. access to the most of, or, you know, most of what's on there. Mm -hmm. Is, do you think that that's, I, I would feel good saying most, but okay. yeah, I, I, because they're, they're constantly changing and yes. adding things. And then yeah. we have to watch, we have an awesome, uh, product manager. He's constantly watching and then seeing what do we have? What can we add? What have they okay. opened up? What do we need to ask for? So we're, yeah. Okay. I awesome. just hate, I hate to overpromise. So yes. that's why if there's some little feature that I'm not, so we'll say most. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> so content generation workshop, you've referred to it a couple of times. Mm -hmm. So we're not currently using class intercom, but I want to bring mm -hmm. my social media interns to that. That's right. yes, Is that really possible? Works. And hold on. Sorry about that. That's okay. Uh, we, we had something turn out. You know what, Jill, I was just at a, um, at a, uh, hotel and like the TV turned on in the middle of the night. My roommate heard it too, but not the monitor. So it was really weird, but anyway. well, this is, yeah, I apologize. This is, a um, our podcast thing. It's supposed to go an hour and 31 minutes and I just turned it on right before I got on yours. So I don't know what that was. So sorry about that. That's okay. okay. This is real. We're not even going to cut that out, Jill, because you and I are just real people. So, <laughs> so, so I want to bring my social media interns next year to your content generation workshop. First of all, is that possible? Yes, definitely. Our workshop is open to anyone. It's not just our clients. We encourage a lot of people to attend. Uh, we host it here in Lincoln, Nebraska. Um, we had a couple hundred kids on site this year. And then we also had satellite locations in Michigan, Kansas, and Illinois, um, sponsored by host schools. So they streamed in. We learned a lot. We're going to change some things to make it even better and more interactive this year. And then we had people streaming from 30 other states too. So we would love to have you come, uh, love to have you participate. It's an awesome day with experts um, sharing content and, and content creators from storytelling to um, a farmer here in Nebraska who's a viral, he's viral on TikTok. He has over a million followers. He's huge on Facebook. He's just made it on all the platforms um, and really been able to monetize that. But he gave the kids some really real, real talk on how you can make money and also how those platforms change it up and make it more difficult. So um, a lot of, a lot of really cool information. 
And it, does that run like nine to three or something like that? We do nine to three central time. Uh, okay. That kind of gives us a good buffer. And then we have a lot of teams will end up staying a little extra, um, you know, to get some support from our experts too. Okay, cool. Yeah. Cause I think I'll, we'll be taking a road trip down and we'll probably stay the night before. And then I don't know if we'll drive back that night or not, or maybe we'll come over to your house and see your chicken. Yep. You guys can come to my house. I got chickens and uh, dogs and a pool. And so uh, I will be more than thrilled to host you. I love it. Um, I just think it's so cool too. Like you said, the little five minute challenges. Um, you know, I have a membership group where I'm training, you know, uh, school PR people from across the country. And we all, um, we all have that competitive spirit. And then it's like, okay, I'm going to do this. Like, even though we're scared, mm -hmm. We're, there's a competition, so I'm going to do it. And that's how we learn. And that's how we grow. And that's how mm -hmm. we figure out what works and what doesn't. And um, so anyways, I am really looking forward to that uh, content generation workshop. You guys can be sure to follow um, along. You can check out classintercom.com. But also I share um, some of these events and you can bet your bottom dollar that I'm going to be talking about that before I take my group next fall. Is it usually in like a late October? It's or? usually in October. This last year it was a digital citizenship week. Um, and okay. so we like to go during that week if we can. Okay. Awesome. I'm excited. Yeah, I'm excited. Yeah, me yeah. too. Uh, we'll see if Bill can come too. We'll, we'll just see if he wants to come along and help drive, help make the drive with uh, some kiddos from, from here in New Auburn, but yeah, right. Um, then Bill and Brady can hang out. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, so what's your best social media tip? If you were to give one, I think you already kind of talked about it a little bit, but you know, what, what's your best tip, whether it be with students or with, with, uh, um, you know, school communicators. Yeah, I, I probably say it too much, but I really just stress being authentic. And by that, I mean, I know we might follow trends and, and try to make those our own, and that's great. But if you're trying to compete with someone down the road, um, we sometimes tend to try to highlight things that they're doing and mimic those rather than staying true to ourselves. So if you're a little school with only three bus routes, there's something really special about that. So lean into what makes you special and that everyone knows your name and that the superintendent can greet you at the door and knows the parents. Those are the stories you want to tell. If you're a huge district and you can offer everything from uh, zoology to ed advanced uh, PR marketing, um, then those are the things that you want to share. But think about what makes your district special. Because when you're telling those stories, you're not only reaching out to prospective families and students, you're also sharing the stories of those that are living it. Um, and people who might want to come and, and be a part of that district too, um, as staff. So uh, just be authentic tell that real story. If your buildings maybe kind of run down, uh, there's something that, you know, rooms are overcrowded. We have to tell those stories too, because if we make it look picture perfect, and then all of a sudden want to pass a, you know, $20 million bond issue, people are like, why would we? Everything's great there. So oh, even as you're telling those positive stories, um, making sure you're being authentic and letting the reality sh shine through too. Yeah. Awesome. So Jill, what is the best way to stay connected to you and then to also learn more about Class Intercom? Yeah, you bet. You mentioned classintercom.com. We have a ton of resources there. Uh, part of our mission is really to support all schools, not just our clients. So please go there. A ton of downloadables from policy to, um, you know, an ebook for starting your team. Um, and then I'm at Dr. Jill Johnson on most social media sites. Um, I'll give you my cell number too, 402-613-8216. Shoot me a text or give me a call. Um, love to help people, whether you're in a jam or uh, just excited about uh, getting students or others involved. I'm happy to help and love to talk strategy. Yeah, awesome. Well, this has been so helpful to me and, and I'm sure countless others. Keep up the great work and uh, we won't see you at, in person at Teespra, but we'll see you soon. We'll definitely be seeing you uh, this summer at Enspra. So thanks for, for all you do for all the schools, whether they're clients or not. Um, it's been fun to learn from you and with you and uh, right alongside you. So keep yeah, it up, we'll Jill. Yeah, same to you. Thank you. And hopefully you can make it to Nebraska. If not before October, we'll definitely look forward to having you then. I will. And I'm going to eat Runza's because they're really good. Even my daughter tried a bite of mine one night, Jill. We were like down to the last three of them. So 
Bill had some and I had some, and then she was like hungry. My college student was home over break. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then she tasted some, she's like, that's really good. And then Bill, Bill had half of his, he's like, you can have this. So it was good. So you've made runs of fans out of all of us Wisconsinites right. now. And now everybody who's not from Nebraska, that's uh, listening to this podcast is Googling Runza. <laughs> yeah. And what is it run? What's a Runza? So a Runza is just basically a uh, hamburger, cabbage, onion, and some spices in a uh, wrapped in bread. And, um, yeah, they seem to be very Nebraska oriented, but maybe coming from a Russian, Polish, German background, but yeah. you can't find them in any of those places. So I think it was people immigrating to Nebraska and making do and uh, they're delicious. And we yeah. even have Runza restaurants. It's called Runza. So. Ooh, awesome. Well, okay. I'll, I'll treat my kids to that place when we come to Nebraska in the fall, for sure. Um, well, thank you guys for listening in to another uh, podcast, another great guest. We'll be back again next week. Um, and until then, keep telling those stories and get those kids involved. Bye-bye, Jill. Bye. Thanks, Andrea.